uh, digital mental health. In this uh, presentation, um, I'm going to talk about the um, overview of um, the digital mental health or telepsychiatry uh, from the history until the pandemic. And then at the middle of the presentation, uh, I will go to another innovative approach that we uh, recently initiated uh, for uh, humanitarian settings, which is about the digital mental health and psychosocial support for restricted area. So, uh, so as, as you know, um, currently there's a growing needs of uh, mental health assistance worldwide after um, many, many issues and many reasons, mainly the, the conflicts and what happened in the last two decades, especially in the Middle East and the um, Arab Supreme that happened in almost five to six countries and then the pandemic and then the new style of life after um, in developing the, the technology and social media and um, climate change and the issue of displacement and migration that increases the, the rate of psychological disorders like depression, anxiety, PTSD, and also the, the prevalence rate of uh, suicide that all uh, make a um, package that people are more in need for the mental health assistance. But still, uh, we have um, lack of uh, mental health professionals and mental health community centers in some areas and in some countries uh, that make it difficult to deliver the mental health assistance for vulnerable people. Uh, that's why the, the digital mental health is a um, very timely initiative uh, for these areas. So um, the digital mental health or telepsychiatry, sometimes they call telepsychiatry in literature or digital mental health, is not a new term or, and it's not a very old term. Uh, the first or the initial attempts to establishing the remote uh, psychiatric care globally have been um, uh, initiated in the United States in the 1970s when the two-way video system was installed between a teaching hospital uh, in the Orwan area to the smaller rural clinics in Nebraska in the United States. But the interest of the uh, telepsychiatry uh, the interest of the telepsychiatry remains low um, because of uh, many factors, uh, among them in, um, in, in three or two decades ago, the, the technology and the communication uh, devices were not very popular and uh, some, some countries or many peoples have no access to that. And also uh, we had very few research on that. So two decades after the initial attempt for the telemental health or telepsychiatry, in 1997, a um, review article published that included uh, 18 studies about the telepsychiatry, which five of them were, were about the economic and uh, visibility of this approach. And eight of them were a cohort study with no control group and uh, the five of uh, them was uh, uh, was a study about comparing the uh, in person or typical psychiatric approach with the telepsychiatry approach but all of them had a small sample size and with no rcts so uh, the study concluded that uh, still the evidence uh, um, that available for making the telepsychiatry or digital mental health widespread is, is very insufficient. Um, so the, 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 the need or the, the approach or the grow uh, of digital mental health until the end of the last century was uh, still in, in low interest. But uh, gradually the, uh, the demand of digital mental health evolved um, especially in um, in 2000, between 2000 to 2013, that we found a lot of the study on the uh, telepsychiatry or digital mental health, um, especially that provided for these are areas that's um, uh, the, the providing the in-person or typical mental health uh, assistance was very hard due to the security issue or the geographical barriers. So uh, several studies published between 2005 and 2013 that indicated uh, the 
majority of the patients, especially among the young people, adolescents, they prefer the uh, digital mental health or video counts, uh, consultation interviews over the face-to-face. So after the COVID-19 pandemic, everything is changing. Majority of um, the clinics or the PHCCs or the mental health um, community centers, they shifted their uh, their approach to the um, online one or to, to the digital one. Uh, still in some countries or some um, community centers or clinics, uh, the telepsychiatry or digital mental health uh, remains a default mode for delivering the uh, mental health assistance, especially uh, in these countries that they have uh, restrictions. So the COVID-19 um, uh, give us a very good hints and there's a lot of research have been done during this period that uh, they expected to remain a digital mental health as a permanent uh, mode for, um, uh, for delivering the psychiatric care even after the post uh, pandemic. So uh, what do you mean by telepsychiatry or digital mental health? According to Drago in 2016, they defined the telepsychiatry or digital mental health as a use of digital technologies such as apps, uh, tele mental, uh, telehealth platforms, and online communications uh, to deliver remote mental health services via video conferencing or uh, phone calls. And the services within the telepsychiatry, including the um, evaluation and assessment of uh, psychiatric disorders and psychological disturbances, therapy sessions, uh, medication management, and uh, consultation. So the um, telepsychiatry could be uh, synchronous via real-time video sessions or live sessions or asynchronous uh, via recording the, your voice or message or videos and then sending to your uh, clients. So there's a lot of um, uh, evidence in, in literature about the patient's um, uh, ac acceptability of the um, uh, remote mental health assistance of services. So majority of them, they see this approach is safe and effective, uh, especially in UK during the pandemic uh, that uh, NHS, uh, the Department of Health and Social Care endorsed the, the use of remote mental health assistance during the pandemic, considering that the video conferencing or video therapy as sufficient as um, in-person one. So in general, there's a lot of evidence, a large body of evidence, uh, in general patients are satisfied with uh, telepsychiatry. So uh, also we have um, uh, studies that uh, have been conducted among the clinical providers or clinicians uh, who are uh, providing the mental health assistance remotely. Um, they generally find that telepsychiatry or digital mental health assistant is easy uh, to use and they believe that their clinical judgment is uh, unaffected by the video consultation. Uh, there's no limitation for, uh, for diagnosing or providing therapy online as we have in person. Well, there's um, some uh, clinicians, uh, they prefer in-person care over the uh, telepsychiatry, but um, the ratio is not very big. So, um, uh, but um, we have some limitations of this evidence that uh, all the studies have been done in this uh, area. They are in recruited very small uh, sample size. That's very makes very difficult to to give a robust conclusion. So um, regarding the assessment uh, or diagnosing the psychological disorders um, in digital mental health or uh, in providing the remote mental health assistance, um, there's some um, literature about that. Uh, among them, the um, uh, randomized trials uh, that have been. Uh, assessed the diagnostic reliability of the telepsychiatry compared to in-person one, uh, they prefer the, the in-person assessment is considered the golden standard of um, diagnosing. Uh, 
but the difference is not uh, very significant between the diagnosing approach in person uh, psychiatric care and uh, telepsychiatric care. So here we have some uh, data about different studies and in different years about the um, about how often telepsychiatry agrees with uh, in person diagnosis. That this number showing that telepsychiatry has good and strong reliability of uh, diagnosing, but um, doesn't suggest that it's better than the uh, in-person one. Regarding the treatment of therapeutic uh, alignments in, in, in both uh, telepsychiatry and uh, uh, typical psychiatric care, um, so, um, uh, you know, um, one of the um, therapeutic alliances is, um, is um, between the patient and the clinical provider is verbal and nonverbal communication that has influencing on the, the recovery plan, the treatment plan, and even on the assessment uh, plan, such as body position, eye contact, uh, body language, nonverbal cues, and nonverbal communications. So we cannot uh, have this... Uh, non-verbal um, uh, communication in the remote uh, care, especially when the case is preferring to have a, um, a phone, um, a phone call therapy over the video conferencing. Uh, but in 2018, a meta-analysis that comparing the therapeutic al uh, alignments in, in remote um, psychiatric care versus the person one, they found that the alliance was um, slightly weaker in person care, but uh, this uh, this evidence or this result uh, doesn't impact on the the, uh, the recovery outcome of the patients. So it means the result is not very uh, significant. Um, telepsychiatry uh, found to be very uh, effective for uh, treating PTSD. Uh, in one study uh, that we found um, you know, met in a systematic review that the PTSD is, uh, uh, will be more uh, getting more benefit from the telepsychiatry over the in-person one. Uh, well, there's another study that um, uh, revealed that there's no significant differences between treating the PTSD from both approaches. So also there's uh, another RCT that... Uh, indicated um, better outcomes for in-person care uh, over the, the remote one for treating PTSD, but the differences was minor and not uh, significant. So why um, digital mental health or telepsychiatry is important, especially for um, uh, currently? Um, what's the advantage of the digital mental health? You know, uh, if you have... Um, uh, digital mental health, uh, we can expand uh, our service and, and everybody have access to, to, the, to our mental health services. Because in some places, there's a lack of um, uh, mental health clinics or mental health hospitals, you know. If you have a telepsychiatry, everybody can have access to care and to treatment. Also, uh, one of the uh, still one of the big uh, challenges we have in mental health is a stigma. Stigma is everywhere. There's a lot of people, they need a mental health assistant, but they cannot seek support due to stigma. So uh, digital mental health can solve these challenges. People can, um, without going to the clinics or hospitals, people see them, they can ask for uh, digital mental health support without anybody know them. So also there's convenience for, for the patients and clinical providers, um, uh, uh, digital mental health promise a flexible schedule. Uh, so everybody can have a very flexible schedule based on their availability. And also the, the clinicians, they can uh, take um, more patients, more clients uh, uh, at the same time because there's no, um, no need the transportation or, you know, the um, waiting list, etc. So they can provide 
uh, more assistance for more people. Also, um, the ability, one of the other advantages of telepsychiatry or digital mental health is uh, uh, reachability of uh, of this assistance. In many areas, we have very lack of mental health professionals. Maybe in one city we have a mental health professionals, in other city we we have no any uh, mental health professionals. So uh, if we have a telepsychiatry or digital mental health, these people people uh, they don't need to transfer to other cities or the other areas. They can just simply ask for the. Um, digital assistance also is cost effective you know you don't need transportation you don't need facility fees you don't rent you don't need anything so the only thing you need is a um, internet and cell phone so um, of course there's a challenge uh, in uh, digital mental health i don't say it's a disadvantage but i am saying the challenges uh, we have to take into our consideration when we are uh, providing the digital mental health. One of them is the technical barriers, uh, technological barriers. So there's, um, there's people, they don't have access to internet or um, high quality internet or the uh, technological devices like laptop or cell phones or maybe in some areas we have um, digital uh, literacy. There's some people, they don't know how to use, you know, um, uh, some devices or how to access to the health, um, telehealth platforms. So this uh, remain a challenge for some people. So another thing is about the privacy and confidentiality. So maybe there's some people that worry about the confidentiality of uh, online, uh, platforms or online uh, therapy. The other things is uh, difficulty in building rapport. You know, before uh, before providing uh, psychotherapy or uh, interventions, um, counseling skill is very important. That make your client uh, feel uh, comfortable. Um, make a trust between you and your client building rapport is part of the treatment maybe in the uh, digital mental health maybe you are facing a uh, difficulty to to providing this rapport with the client that maybe needs some time or needs more session until we are making our client comfortable um, in our session online and licensing and um, regulation, you know, um, because um, still the digital mental health or telepsychiatry is uh, um, is not um, considered in many countries or many areas. They are still on the traditional ones. So still we need um, a law on the regulation of the telepsychiatry um, um, ethical cause. And, and uh, these are things maybe uh, we need uh, to... Uh, to expand or to developing um, SOP uh, for telepsychiatry in some countries. So there are some uh, some things that facilitate to to develop or to consider uh, on uh, digital psychiatry, especially digital mental, especially in this um, uh, century. So because uh, we have a lack of um, clinical providers in, in many areas, in many countries, you have very uh, lack of mental health professionals. If I'm talking in Iraq, in Iraq, we have significant uh, lack number of uh, mental health professionals. Even in, in, in some, some cities, we have no, uh, almost no clinical providers, mental health clinical providers. So this is one of the points that we have to think about developing the digital mental health. Uh, to fill in, the, in this gap. And, and also prevalence of mental health problems. You know, the, if you are comparing the data of, um, uh, of uh, this uh, decade with the, with the other decades, still we have very uh, high ratio of mental health problems. So we need more care without restriction and without anything. Uh, we have to provide them mental health assistance to everybody um, everywhere. That's why the, uh, considering uh, the digital mental health is very important. Um, 
as you uh, all know that currently there's a war conflict and displacement and migration everywhere, especially after the Russia-Ukraine war and now in Gaza, Lebanon, you know, there's a lot of people in need for mental health assistance. And due to security issue, due to um, logistical barriers, we cannot provide direct or in-person mental health assistance. That's why we have a digital mental health. It's very important at this time. So also the, uh, the diagnosing or the treating the mental health problems uh, isn't like a physical or biological problems. We don't need the physical examination. So this is another good point that uh, helps uh, the digital mental health will be more considerable. So also the stigma, as we said, the stigma is one of uh, big issue of the mental health. So to mitigating or to solving the issues of the stigma, uh, the mental health assistance will be a very good option or, or alternative. Uh, so also, as we said, there's lack or challenging to accessing the psychiatric hospitals or clinics in some areas. So if you have, um, so this point is help us to uh, think more about uh, having uh, digital mental health or shifting the, uh, the psychiatric care totally from the in-person one to the, to the online one or to the digital one. So also there's other thing uh, technologically that help us to to, um, to think about the digital mental health everywhere is a, a rapid development of the technology like the uh, internet-based uh, video therapy apps or foundations like I'm working in the ComSci, which is uh, um, the American uh, foundation that purely providing the, the online assistant everywhere in the world. So virtual reality, VR, and the II, pro, uh, II programs that all this um, uh, give us a good um, chance to uh, developing the digital mental health. So uh, one of the main point we have currently uh, uh, regarding the digital mental health is a uh, uh, is uh, the, the, the problem we have in humanitarian settings. You know, in the emergency settings, in the crisis situation, like we have in, uh, in Gaza and Lebanon. So uh, it's very hard to humanitarian workers or humanitarian NGOs to provide mental health assistance. So yet in the mental health, in the humanitarian assistance, we don't have the platform or the guideline or the checklist protocol for digital mental health. So based on this, um, uh, on this uh, challenge or on this gap, we uh, came across to develop um, uh, or to initiate a very unique and innovative approach for providing mental health and psychosocial assistance, especially for the humanitarian settings. Uh, so we already published an um, um, uh, article uh, from Lancet Psychiatry uh, that we initiated the, the importance of the digital mental health in humanitarian settings. Uh, and also we provided a, a flow chart and also we recommended that how this tool will be developed and what study should we do. So currently we are working on on this approach that we call it uh, electronic mental health and psychosocial support, uh, which is abbreviated for EMHPSS or digital mental health in humanitarian settings. So um, what's uh, EMHPSS or and that stands for electronic mental health and psychosocial support is a project designed to leverage a digital guideline to provide mental health services in humanitarian context. So in this project, it is different from what we said at the beginning of the presentation. This approach is purely for humanitarian context, for the humanitarian assistance during the, the, the war crisis, uh, conflict, emergency, like in Lebanon, just 1 million people displaced, a thousand people have been killed due to the airstrike of Israel. So uh, nobody can go there to provide the mental health assistance. So if you have this tool, we can provide uh, the mental health assistance for people um, anywhere in the world. 
So our aim to uh, this um, approach, EMHPSS, is to make a uh, standardized guideline or SOP to improve the access to mental health care for displaced population, including refugees and people in conflict zone. So as we say, still in humanitarian, in the mental health of humanitarian context, we do not have a standard uh, digital mental health. Uh, health uh, on how to deliver the digital mental health for people in need. Uh, so uh, the the um, digital MHPSS or electronic MHPSS is um, very efficient because uh, it helps everybody to have access to uh, mental health support uh, uh, in areas with limited infra uh, infrastructure, as we said, limited uh, of uh, health professionals, uh, mental health professionals, limits of uh, um, NGO actors that providing the uh, mental health assistance, also reducing the stigma associated with the mental health. We are offering this approach is offering the confidential and remote assistance that everybody can um, get benefits from it. So uh, another key important of this approach is that uh, this approach is promising to provide immediate intervention through the virtual plat platforms or to, through the digital platform. So when um, the, um, the issue happening somewhere like happened in Gaza and uh, in Lebanon, uh, it takes a while to provide mental health assistance. It needs a coordination, a security coordination, and you need to approval to go there. It makes it, it, it make time to go there, provide assistance. And the people are suffering. At the same time, they are suffering. Maybe they are suffering from trauma, etc. But the EMHPSS is immediately provide the mental health assistance directly for them that maybe prevent them to uh, to deteriorate their situation or prevent them from reaching to the chronic trauma and chronic uh, mental health disorders. Uh, so yeah, this is all about the um, uh, EMHPSS, so EM, uh, EMHPSS in action. Currently, we are doing the coordination and we have a, a very nice team that people around the world, they show uh, interest to join our task force working to uh, on developing the EMHPSS project. So first, we are doing the pilot project. We are uh, following the Delphi study uh, to... Um, uh, gathering the experts' input about how uh, developing the digital mental health guidelines that we already created our proposal and questionnaires that we are assessing every um, corner of digital image pieces, like um, developing the ethical guidelines and then everything. Uh, then maybe we are going to uh, piloting our findings or our protocol in some uh, restricted area or conflict zones like refuge campus in Iraq, in Lebanon, and in Syria. So as we said, uh, this project is delivering mental health services to emergency and in humanitarian uh, contexts. So this is our flowchart that we are following on um, our pilot study and our Delphi study uh, that uh, demonstrated that step by step how we are going to develop uh, the EMHPSS protocol until we are uh, reaching to the uh, implementing or standardizing this tool everywhere. So the benefits of uh, EMHPSS. So as we said, currently we only have the typical or traditional MHPSS assistant in humanitarian settings. So EMHPSS is increasing accessibility. As we said, everybody uh, in the conflict zone, in the refuge camps, they cannot get out from the camps. They can have access to the MHPSS. So overcoming uh, the traditional barriers, including the stigma or um, the issue of uh, confidentiality and privacy. There's many people, they cannot go to them or they, they are not going to seek a mental health assistance due to uh, privacy and confidentiality, but the EMHPSS is totally online. Uh, they can promise to keep the privacy of everybody. So it's very rapid and immediate uh, assistance that directly during the um, emergency situations, 
we can provide the system without waiting for for approval for anything. Uh, and this uh, immediate approach or intervention help uh, the people to reduce the long-term psychological impact of trauma, you know, because the direct intervention is very helpful to prevent them from further harm. Also, it's cost-effective. Um, uh, even for the NGOs, you know, for the NGO, if they want to uh, provide the mental health assistance, they have to go there, hiring a lot of people, train them and uh, establishing the clinics and the community centers and they need car transportation, etc. So, but the MHPSS no need such uh, stuff. So that's why uh, it's not very expensive and very cost friendly. So, as we said, still we are in the... Uh, in the stage of uh, developing uh, and working on this project. So um, we already have uh, many great minds that uh, uh, showed in interest to work on this project, but still we are very open and we are very welcoming people and collaborators and contributors to, uh, to join our task force and working on the uh, electronic mental health and psychosocial support in humanitarian settings. So if, you, if you'd like to, to participate in this project, you or your university or your organization uh, or you personally, uh, you are very welcome to join us. Maybe you are emailing me at uh, daria.rostam at queeruniversity.org or daria.r.ahmed at gmail.com. So we can have coordination and collaboration on this uh, project. So thank you very much for your listening and for your attention. Um, so this is my presentation. Um, I'm open if you have any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Daria, for your nice presentation. This is a very relevant topic. And uh, we all know that uh, a lot of uh, countries, a number of countries, they are going through a lot of crisis related to war. And uh, people are displaced and uh, there is a huge need of uh, psychosocial support, mental health support. Probably we cannot uh, provide them uh, in-person support, but uh, online digital mental health support can be a solution or replacement for the uh, uh, I open the house for discussion. Whether there is any questions, uh, you can ask Daria. Can I ask the thing? Um, right. Okay. I'd like to know whether it's possible, um, or whether it's possible to say what's the best time to intervene in different types of uh, context. So the question is sometimes, you know, it might be better to, you know, some some um, some information says. This very early debriefing, sometimes it's not helpful. Sometimes it's better to provide psychotherapy in uh, situations where things are a bit more settled. So the question being, is it is it better to, you know, to support whilst there is a conflict, whilst there is war, or is it sometimes better to wait after the war when people are in a more settled um, and future-focused environment? So uh, that's a very good question. You know, in humanitarian settings, we have a guideline from Interagency Standard Committee called MHPSS Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. And we have a pyramid from each layers, we have different uh, activities. The first and immediate activity or the mental health assistance that we are providing during the emergency, which is the first hand intervention is psychological first aid. So we are providing the psychological first aid and we are not providing the comprehensive um, psychotherapy or psychosocial support. So just to protect people from further harm and helping them to, to, to calm down, you know, uh, preventing from uh, getting um, very, very um, uh, chronic disorders, we are providing the psychological first aid, which is... Um, very basic and very simple. And after some few sessions, if we saw the case needs more assistance, we are referring to the, uh, to the second layer, which is um, um, group psychosocial support or individual psychosocial support. Uh, if we find the case still need more comprehensive assistance, then we are sending to the other layers of the intervention, which is specialized intervention by the clinical psychologists or by psychiatrists uh, to providing uh, medication. So at first, 
Uh, we are just providing the basic psychosocial support like psychological first aid. Can I ask you another question? So some people, so there's some discussions that uh, CBT can be done by more or less or other psychotherapy can be done by bots without any person being involved. Is that something you might have have considered or is this something which is completely off the track? We have both. We have a CBT that um, modified to the online version. You know, we have a manual of the CBT for the in-person version. Now we have another tool that modified for the online person that the, the, the human are providing the CBT online, but it is modified to the online version. At the same time, we have a chatbot. We have a robot and the AI that people can um, can talk or, you know, doing the uh, interview and uh, counseling with the chatbot. Uh, the very advanced one is a uh, Wiza. We have a Wiza. Is a chatbot that uh, people are using to communicate in the absence of the human uh, therapist. And does it work? Is there other comparative studies on that? Yeah, we have, and as we showed, uh, the studies um, not for for the for the robot and the chatbots, but for the um, human uh, online therapy is is effective. Uh, uh, yeah, we have study for that, but for the humanitarian, we don't have, you know, and uh, we have this study, and that's why we uh, we are going to develop uh, uh, this protocol and initiative for the humanitarian workers. Still, we have very like uh, uh, study uh, in this regard for the humanitarian context. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a couple of things to comment about. One is. Uh... When there is a, there is a, when we were talking about a war prone zone, when there is a, no internet facility and uh, uh, resources are very compromised state. So in that case, maybe a mobile telehealth uh, platform may be useful. So because the population is continuously migrating from one place to another place, maybe a mobile uh, e facility uh, may be more useful. That can be a component of EMH uh, PSS. Uh, second uh, comment is uh, a lot of people who are on merchant navy or they are in sea, they stay in the sea for quite long time. The health facilities available in the sea is uh, uh, mostly for the basic healthcare facilities. Uh, but suppose somebody develops some psychiatric illness or some psychological issues, uh, e-mental health support can be one option to provide uh, those people who are uh, quite away from the land in the sea for uh, uh, some uh, some other purpose. So e-mental health support can be one option that can be provided to people who are at need. Yeah, for sure. We have all these options and the um, e, uh, MHPSS will be the, the alternative and the option for all this. And um, I'm sure they are um, it's filling a lot of the gaps we have currently, uh, uh, especially for the vulnerable people that uh, they have no access to the mental health approach. So our uh, DEFI study will be very comprehensive and we considered all these points and uh, we will try to find out the solution uh, for, for the challenges that you that this approach will be facing. Uh, can, uh, I, can I mention something? Before we started this conference, we had a bit of a chat with um, Professor Norman Satorius, and I don't know whether you had been um, privy to that, but he said to me that the uh, World Psychiatric Association as a work, working group of about eight, eight uh, very experienced people who work on e-mental health and its application. So these people might be interested, and in this case, it might be um, quite good to contact Norman Satorius again, and maybe you can copy me into this in case. Okay? Yeah, it will be very interesting. Sure, yeah. I also shared my uh, my email in the chat box, so anybody would like to join the project, so uh, we'll be happy for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so thank much, Nadia. Uh, now we'll move to the last.